Welcome to another episode of Resilient Riches. We have the infamous Sylvia Jablonski, who is, if you've seen her on any business page, she's usually front and center talking about defiance ETFs and about how what she's done in such a short amount of time in this ETF company when no other ETF companies were making it. Sylvia stepped in. She's running the company. She's one of the fa- she's one of the founders. She's been a super success, a super phenomenon. Fox Business, Yahoo Business, uh, Yahoo Finance, uh, Bloomberg, any financial conversation there is, Sylvia is right there in the forefront. Uh, not only is she just on that side and just talking about what she's doing, she's also one of the fastest, it's one of the fastest growing ETFs in the country, but she's also a proud founder with Israeli Defense Force uh, veterans coming out with new ETFs in, every day. They're very big in the thematic ETF, uh, the thematic investing, which is something that we'd love to hear about. And Sylvia, tell us a little bit about you and we'll get right into it. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks so much for having me. Yep. So I am the current CEO and CIO of Defiance ETFs, and I've been there since, gosh, I guess it's been about three and a half years now. Prior to that, I, you know, I started my career on a trading desk. I was pretty much trading Delta One, equity derivatives, swaps, that kind of thing. And I happened to be trading for an ETF issuer um, who at that time was looking to launch one of the first levered inverse ETF products. And and so my career in ETFs really started, you know, a couple of years out of college where I joined this firm in 2008 in like the heat of the financial crisis that had, you know, 3X bull and bear ETFs basically that tracked, you know, banks on a daily basis and spent like a decade or so there. Uh, and, and that's, you know, where I worked with Matt Belsky, who's the original, you know, the, the first kind of founder, primary chairman of, of Defiance ETFs. And you know, ended up joining Defiance with him. And, you know, so here we are trying to grow an ETF company. Yeah, I know it was not easy to grow an ETF company. And the back, the backing and the reason why it's called Defiance is because Matt's grandfather was actually one of the uh, one of the Bielski families. He was the Russian Parzan in the movie Defiance. And uh, one of his biggest investors right at the beginning was actually one of the families that his grandfather saved in the Holocaust, which is really, really amazing. And I know you guys are coming out with some cutting edge strategies, but Sylvia, what is your background? How did you get to this point? Because it's it's really not normal, especially women in financial services is a very unique position. And and I know how public you are and how, how outspoken you are about, about what you do and, and empowering other people. How did you get to this point? And, and how would you advise people and, and give guidance to women who are getting to financial services, how to find the success that you've had? Uh, thanks so much for for the kind words, and and I think it's you know it's a really difficult thing to define. I think like anyone else, you know, I I always knew that I wanted to do something that had to do it with investing in markets. I I loved watching markets. I would you know sit at the dinner table with my dad, and who was always getting yelled at by my mom to you know turn off <laughs> turn off CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever he was watching and and eat dinner. But I was I just got hooked on it, and you know so so I kind of education wise followed you know, the studies into that field. And I I don't know, I think, you know, a lot of it is just number one, you just like actually have to have the genuine interest in something to do well at it. I I think a lot of people maybe get, you know, business degrees or try to get jobs in finance or at ETF companies because maybe they they think they pay well or, or maybe it sounds good on paper to work for XYZ bank or whatever it is. And then, you know, you kind of see them getting there and it not working out. So I think, you know, how did I get here? Um, the first thing is I started on a trading desk and that is a very competitive space. And as you said, you know, I happen to be a female. There weren't a whole lot of females back then on no. on these trading desks. But for me, it was like, again, I think I just loved it. I, I wanted to be really good at it. And, and if I could give, you know, kind of one piece of advice from my experience at the banks, you know, first is that I was always kind of, you know, trying to learn what what people who were you know training me to do things when i first started um did and and trying to think of thoughtful questions trying to offer my time like you know when you start out you kind of get grunt work right you pay your dues and things like that but i would always kind of ask like hey can i learn about this new product and um just always you know talking to people trying to make relationships but but sincere relationships you know not asking for like mentorship just offering something up and then kind of finding your vibe with people that are, you know, willing to teach you or maybe get some value from working with you and, and you know, really kind of like growing and fostering those relationships. And I think when you're in a huge bank, stuff like that goes a long way. Otherwise, you're kind of, you know, lost and you end up being a number. So 
um, just really being out there and, and trying to, you know, learn as much as you can and trying to make sure you're heard and, you know, and, and doing your thing. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I started working at a time where, um, and I don't know if this is advice or good advice or bad advice, but I worked in, I started working on trading. You're, you're pretty successful. So I'm sure it's good. Advice. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would really base it on. Subjects are touching sometimes, proof, right? But I'll just. Yeah, yeah. But, but proof, is in, proof is in the pudding. Proof is yeah. in the pudding. So it's going to be good advice if you're given it. Yeah. I mean, I never, so maybe this is a weird thing to say, but like, I never like realized that I was a woman in finance. Right. And you can, you know, our, my, my current chairman and boss and founder will tell you the same thing. Like, I, I was just a, a person. I had no, you know what I mean? I never thought like, uh oh, it's going to be harder for me because I'm a girl or like I'm going to be discriminated against. And I, you know, I worked at, I started working at a trading desk at a time where like it was okay to joke around. People had fun. I, I think that, you know, people were super professional, but they were also, you know, like not so worried about having relationships with men. You know, there, there's good and bad, right? The, of the things that have happened in the world. But one of the bad things that has come, um, with some of the topics that come up around discrimination is that people become afraid to have friendships and talk and stuff like that. So, Absolutely. Um, there's, been some, there's been some actions that have come up. I have a neighbor of mine who used to work well, at Deutsche yeah. Bank and there's a whole suing thing. I mean, it's, you know, people got yeah. scared now and they're, and they're worried about, you know, what am I going to say? What, how's that going to be? I got to watch out myself and it's going to be on the internet for the rest of my life. So I got to be more careful. Yeah. And so I think that like as a young woman in finance, right. Um, so I, I think if you just, you know, if you kind of like work really hard and know your topic and do your job and, and you're you're working with people, men and women as peers, and you're not kind of like overthinking it all, you know what I mean? Um, being human, getting to know people, getting, you know, like per, having personal relationships and friendships that, that are, you know, professional, but also sincere. I think that stuff goes a long way. And, you know, through my career, it's always been like that. Like I, whoever, you know, the first boss I ever had, I w was so good to me and I tried to, you know, kind of learn from him. And, and every time, you know, he got promoted, he, he was, you know, maybe a decade or so older than me when I started and had quite a bit more experience. Every time he got promoted or went to a different desk, you know, he brought me with him. And then there was somebody who worked for me that had that similar type of role. And I brought that person with me. And so I, yeah, I think, loyalty. You know, yeah, relationships go a long way. And then in terms of like, just good, you know, good advice when you are young, if, and people have different types of financial situations, but if you have stability, enough stability in your life where, you know, you can kind of pay your bills for a year or whatever it might be. And an opportunity comes up where in your gut, you feel like this could crash and burn or be the biggest thing that I'll ever be part of. Um, but you have like a really good job with a really steady paycheck that, you know, seems almost difficult to walk away from like, take that chance. You know, if your gut tells you that you want to do it, but you're just scared of losing, you know, the golden handcuffs, like cut the golden handcuffs, you know? So the first yeah. really smart decision that I ever made, and again, I was working at, you know, large global investment bank. I had a position on a trading, you know, trading desk. I had like top clients, great bosses. I had credibility. I'd been there, worked, you know, worked my way into my role and stuff like that. Steady as it goes. Right. Um, and then I went to join a firm that was launching Leverage University TFs that the whole world hated. You know, um, there was only one of them out there and the whole world hated it. Um, they were thought to blow up. Um, you know, they, they must blow up and that's going to happen. The fund had, the firm had no money, no, you know, like anything really. It was just a good idea. And the CEO of that firm just said to me, I need to, I, I want to hire you. I just want to, I don't even know what I'm going to do with you really, but I need to hire somebody who knows how to trade these things, can talk to people about these things, can figure out how they work and educate people on these things. And like, like if, if you're willing to take a risk, I think this is going to be a big thing, you know, like c come over basically, right? For a fourth of your salary. <laughs> I, so, so when I I was in Ruck, when I went to a university, I had to put myself through college because my father here didn't want to pay for it and couldn't <laughs> couldn't pay for it. But in his fairness, uh, I have six children, so it's like six tuitions, not so easy. We go yeah. to the private school, Orthodox private school. So there's it's a lot of expense. 
Yeah, it's the, yeah. It's the, re- it's oh, the real deal. I know deal. it. I live in New York City with kids. I know it. It's, it's you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. here. Yeah. It's, too, it's Yeah, I, I, I live on the Upper East Side, so I, I know it. I just paid my first. And then next year, it's talk. And my, my wife said to me, she goes, oh, yeah, so if we put Julian in school, it's going to be this number. I went, that's a, that's a real number. That's, oh, yeah. That's I mean, my four-year-old is in a, you know, private fours program for three hours a day. And I think it's yeah. about three hours a day. paid for... Uh, in Manhattan, it's about what I paid for tuition my first year of college at Boston College. It's double <laughs> my son's three hours and forty five minutes. I'm not ex- forgetting those fifteen extra minutes. Yeah, it's double what I paid for college. Uh, that's why a year. It's, it's people say, "Oh, like, college is so expensive." He says, "What are you talking about? I'm saving money now." Yeah, it's a it's a funny thing. But so so one of my one of my clients, I, I was in fitness. One of my clients was was he was uh, he was probably worth one hundred thirty hundred forty million dollars. This guy, Mike, and his partners were billionaires. And he always said to me, he goes, I said, I want to get into financial services. How, how do you think I should be successful? He said, you find a mentor that's ultra, ultra successful. You hang out with him. You find him. You just do whatever he needs to do, and you become a sponge. And you're going to learn to graduate and grow with him over time. And I did that, and I graduated. And over time, my mentor retired. I was able to to take over his clients and and built my own very significant book of business and brought my dad in. And then we grew and grew and grew the firm. But because we were able to one be coachable, which we tell people all the time, be coachable, yeah. be likable, and and just like just genuinely have curiosity when nobody likes repeating themselves twice. So if they say to you, Hey, this is how you do it. And then you forget. And then an hour or two days later, you ask them the same exact question. They're not going to want to mentor you anymore because that means that you're not absorbing the information. So I would go around when I worked at Merrill Lynch, I would go around with a notebook and whenever anybody would say something, I would write it down. They're like, Oh, who's that kid with a notebook? I'm like, I'm going to make more money than you. And I make, thank God that's something that I've, I've been I'm totally with you on that, by the way, I was the notebook nerd too. And I think it's so yeah. important. I can tell you, I so important. a young kid that interned for me who, who's applying for his first, graduated college is applying for his first job at an ETF company. And he was like, can you help me, you know, kind of like prep for this. And we, we got on the call. And so I was like, all right, well, t- like kind of tell me what you know about the company. Cause I know, but I don't work for this company, but I know a lot about them. And I kind of look them up in lieu of our call, you know, our call or whatever. And like, he couldn't tell me what their, you know, top product was or how long they've been around or, and I was like, it's ridiculous. You can never, like, you can never, first of all, start a call like that ever again. (laughs) You know, it's me. So you're like, fine, I know you, but like, don't do that. Like, make sure, you know, like. And I think that's a fault of the educational system. Like, so whoever he went to college, they should be prepping him and explain to him that, you know, when you go on an interview or you're going, this is what you have to do. It's common sense, but. You know, yeah. that's that's that, that's something that everybody says. Common sense is not so common. Right. And I think like and thinking about questions, you know, and some of the questions that um, that he was asking, you know, were things like um, that, you know, he had written down a list of questions that he was going to ask his interviewer. And they were things like, you know, how do you think I can best sell these products? And I'm like, this guy wants you to tell him how you are going to sell his product, right? Like, um, yeah, that's the whole point. Your job right. is to sell it and you have to sell him. <laughs> right, right, and right. Then you, if you can't sell the owner of the company that believes wholeheartedly, you're not going to be able to sell anybody. Yeah. I'm sorry to tell you. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, it, it's, it's a great point that's made there. Like it, it, it's something that they should teach you in, in, in school and university. Like I would have had loved to have, you know, luckily I had like a super strict dad that was like, you have to know this, that you you don't ever walk into a room without please and thank you. And this, you know, but, but I think if university courses taught kind of just that practical stuff that, you know, I don't know how you grade it. You can't give someone an A for like learning obvious things, I guess, but they're so important. Um, You know what I find the grade is how much money you make. That's, that's the grade. Because if you don't have it, it'll break you. But if it's it's if you don't have those things, I remember I, actually when I graduated Rutgers, and this was something very very interesting that that Rutgers gave to all the business school students. They gave them, and I'm not so proud of Rutgers right now, just to be clear. But we can we won't talk about that. They gave you a handbook, and it was called the Life Handbook. And yeah. and I remember I would go to di- I would go to lunches and dinners, and I know I don't think I ever told you this. And they would you would have a napkin on the plate, and I. We didn't know what to do with a napkin on the plate. You didn't know that you had to put it on your lap. And in the book, it says to you, when they put a napkin on your on the plate, you put that on your lap. And you don't know this. So I'm like, I've, I've been in like business meetings. I went to like 
networking meetings. I went to like interviews and I'm not putting the napkin on my lap. I'm leaving it there on the side. And and it was actually very, very smart. And I've given it, I, I, I lost the book. I don't know where it is anymore, but it's a really, really good book talking about like these little life things that you really need to know. So I'm sure your mother told you to put the napkin on your lap. And you told <laughs> when you're 12 years old, you said, what do you know? Nothing. And then you're not going to listen. Here That's I am. I think. My, my wife was is European. <laughs> And she's very, she was always, I'm not at all into that, but she is very into manners. And I'm sh sure she told them all. Napkin on the lap, things. everybody. But as it it are, matters. They Look, like it matters. It matters. Makes a huge difference. I remember seeing, I remember seeing somebody with a, a, a notebook and the notebook had like stains, uh, had stains on it. Or it was like, it's a composite notebook and you're coming in for an interview in our office and you're coming in with like, like one of those black and white notebooks and you yeah. had like a page. I was like, this guy's getting it. Like, I can't. I can't teach him how to send an email or how to send a calendar <laughs> right? Like I just don't have that type of bandwidth. Um, but I, 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 and how did you, it sounds like you took some really big risks yeah. in your career. Where did that like strength come from? Because not many people will take risk and, and we call it, sorry to make fun of the bankers. We call it bank mentality is when people are stuck in the bank, they're going to ride the bank. They're going to get their paycheck. It's a really good paycheck and they're not going to take any risks. So they try to come into our world, into financial services. And they're like, oh, I worked at the bank. Everyone's going to talk to me. And then they, they crash and burn because it's really, really hard. How did you, where did you get that courage? And where did you, where was that, that moment in your life that you draw on, that you drew on when it was really, really challenging? Yeah, I, and and actually that's a really great point. And in both cases, so I did this twice in my career. I ended up spending over a decade at Direction, and and I watched it go from zero to thirty billion when I left. You know, I, I ended up becoming a partner in the firm, all this stuff. So there were two occasions in my life. The second time was when I left Direction to join Defiance. Again, it was a situation mm -hmm. where I was quitting when they were about to give me the keys, right, to 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 lead the company, and and you know. Um, making it impossible to leave. And in both situations, I can't even tell you like how many people, including the firms themselves said, this is career suicide. What are you doing? You can't come back from this. First of all, when you're in your twenties, you can come back from anything for sure. And like, likely you're in a good situation where, you know, when I made the first move, I didn't have kids. I was single in New York city. You know, I was in my twenties, like, like who cares? Right. I could, I could, get it. I, I always, so where does it come from? I think it's the immigrant in me. And I know that, you know, you all have this background too. I came, you know, my, my family came here from, from Poland many years ago and they left jobs where they were PhDs and had a master's degrees and were professors at universities and doing super well. We had a good life. They, they left to like flee communism, come to America where for many, many years, you know, they struggled. They had to translate all their degrees. They had to learn how to speak English. Like, um, you know, like having a lot of money is not the same as having a lot of money in America. So, you know, years of kind of like struggling and just seeing them do whatever they had to do. Um, you know, my mom was like laminating books in a factory at night to make extra money when she had a master's degree in finance and she ended up like running a company later. Right. And it all kind of turned around. But so I guess it's like, I just saw that, you know, kind of no matter where you are in your life, like I've seen, a privileged life and I've seen the hustle and and either way it's it's fine and you make it work right so I think what allows me to make those decisions is I just have that immigrant like Polish mentality like if this doesn't work out and everything falls apart like I'll go work at Starbucks I'll babysit I'll clean like I'll do anything I need to do okay. day trade on the They're side be <laughs> and I'll be fine yeah. Yeah. My, when we went through our, our financial troubles I, I get a lot of my strength from my mom um, and I don't Thanks. give her nearly enough Thanks. credit at, at all, but I get a lot of strength from my mom. And, and that when we went through financial struggles and my dad had to leave, he was leaving and switching companies just to, just to really put food on the table. Uh, my mom worked early morning. Uh, she would, she would cook, clean, do everything. She went to the gym every single day at like 5 AM. And everybody used to say my mom was like a superwoman. She'd go into the city. She'd slept into the city all day, work at a jewelry company on her lunch break. She would do private jewelry sales, like small, whatever she could repairs, whatever we could then she'd come home, she'd serve dinner, she forced us to sit for dinner, which was very, very annoying. And then from there, she would go work at like the, the ritual bath area um, for like 18 bucks an hour or something like that. Yeah. And she and then she would crash because she would always fall asleep and then fall and then and then to the TV, which is like poison for you. And she refuses to accept it. I never watch TV, but she always does. Um, <laughs> and then do it again. And that's that's really what got us through. It was something exceptional yeah. that uh, that 
that only only a mom strength has. And now that think that we've done thank God so well, she's retired and she really she's very busy, but doesn't really have a lot going on. But also, I mean, yeah, just it's a to compliment too. her further. Personality. Yeah, just to compliment her further. I mean, I was on the road for many years for a couple of years in sales. And she was on her own. Like I would leave on like a Monday and come back on a Friday and she yeah. had to run this. She had to look after the kids by her, by herself, which some of the kids complain a lot about. And, but, and uh, you have a good amount of was. kids. Like that's, that's really hard. I mean, it's really, really hard. I have two and it's hard. <laughs> I have two. It's so hard. My youngest is so tough. Yeah. Such my oldest tough is so kid. tough. It's, uh, I, think it comes back <laughs> I like to, it though. I think so. it comes back to what you said before <laughs> You got to do what you got to do, and you know, yeah. no matter what, you know, you have the confidence in your own self, in your own personality inside your heart. You know, you're going to be okay, no matter what. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, whatever it is, you'll 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 recover, and you'll go on, and maybe do something even more fantastic. You're yeah, not afraid. You're not afraid true. of the failure. Exactly. Exactly. And I and I also think that it's it's something that some of the younger generations are missing a little bit like i started working illegally at you know a, a family business when i was 13 years old because nice. i wanted to go skiing and like my dad wouldn't let me he wouldn't give me any money so i was like okay fine i'm gonna work oh, that's how i feel make money I you know what i mean like i don't I and then i never wanted to ever i also have this mentality and i still have it like I don't ever want to ask anybody for money. I, I want to always be capable, educated enough, have the work ethic, the drive, whatever it is to like make sure that I can provide a situation where my family has security and, and, you know, God forbid something happens, you know, people are always there to help you. Families there to pick you up, but you like, you, you have to make yourself, you know, you have to be self-sufficient, right. And you have to think about um, a future and things like that. So it's, yeah, I mean, and when I made the second decision, I would say what gave me the strength to do it, believe it or not, it, it's, I, I thought a lot about, I, I thought a lot about this recently, actually, with Charlie Munger passing. Yeah. And there was a quote that his, um, that Warren Buffett's, I think, ex-wife said um, that, you know, um, Charlie Munger thought Warren Buffett was the smartest person in the world. And Warren Buffett thought Charlie Munger was the smartest person in the world. And they were the people who each other liked the best. So when I worked at Direction with Matt, who, you know, started Defiance, the family history there, things like this, like for five years, we sat next to each other. We've traveled the country together, you know, selling products, trying to build a business, doing all these things. And like he, you know, A, I think we both have kind of like the same energy, the same ambition and drive. Like we both really wanted to be successful. We always wanted to beat everybody in like sales or whatever it was that we were doing. Um, so that's really good, but it was also very much like it was a, it was a trusted partnership, you know. And we've been through many ups and downs, like whether it was through direction, you know, um, like everything, right? Like the the big corporate politics, things like this. And now here we are at a company where we had, you know, we were soaring, and then the market turned against us for two years, and like we're watching assets fall, and it's, you know. Um, you have to trust your partner. And I, I think making decisions to, so sometimes it's easier to make big decisions. And this happened to me both at Direction and Defiance. I really trusted and believed in and had a sincere relationship with the person I was going to partner with, work for, work with. Um, you know, Matt worked for me at some point. I work from him. I don't know the difference, right? Like, yeah, we work with, we say that all the time. I work with, I work yeah. with, I don't know. Nobody works for me. I work with. Exactly. I, I just don't like it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think like, um, you know, like we've been tested so many times and and like we have each other's back. So I think being loyal in this business and, you know, really kind of like sticking up for, sticking it out with, you know, good times and bad, whether you disagree, agree on different decisions with like your partner, like, like honor your partnership, right? Like be Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, there's be, lots to be said no for it. Know your know your team. It's 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 something really really important. Where are you seeing um, your company? Where are you seeing your trajectory? Where are you seeing the next stages for you? I mean, it, it's, is the yeah. goal to sell? Is the goal to uh, to get this liquidity event and then just hang out with your kids? Which it doesn't sound like your older one. You'd hang out with the younger one. You would. <laughs> but where? 
and my wife has opinions on those too as well as are too but where, what is the next stage for you and and it sounds like you're never going to stop because i'm never going to stop yeah i'm not looking uh, for like a, the goal you know we obviously we obviously had a startup and we have investors so obviously the first goal is to get investors paid back as soon as possible and then to get them you know a return on their investment beyond what they put into the company. That's always your goal. And that can be achieved through being super, super successful and growing a huge profitable firm and paying, you know, kind of paying dividends back. It can be achieved through a big exit, you know, so the, the, for, for us, like the sky is the limit. Um, we, what are we doing? You know, we've, we've learned a lot, I would say, you know, we have a couple of success, really successful products. And then we saw a lot of products just, you know, kind of flop and fail. So we've learned from our mistakes. We've learned to, be um, kind of more precise in the things that we put into the market. And, you know, we recently came upon a great, you know, great idea and we really went all in. And so, you know, where will we go next in the near future? We're going to kind of expand on this, this product suite. Basically we launched these, you know, three um, unique first mover, zero data expiry options products. And they bought in, you know, $300 million basically in less than two months. So Amazing. we're going to grow the company. Um, and yeah, I mean, personally, I, I don't ever, Matt and I talk about this all the time. Like there's no retirement, right? It's either like, we're so successful with this. We just keep it going or we have an act, whatever it is. We have to pay the investors back one way or the other, make, get it, you know, it kind of like make it really worthwhile for everyone, make it happy. But like, I mean, we can grow it to the moon together, you know? Um, amazing. And yeah, I mean, I won't retire. Like if, if we're all still, you know, God willing, alive decades from now, I'm probably going to be like 90 and working somewhere. I just don't have, you know, I don't have it in me. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, ama it's an amazing thing. Um, if, if you were to give a few tips for, for two people I want to give tips to is, yeah. is young people who are looking to or in the financial services world and want to go off on their own and create a startup like you or join a startup or, or go from this large conglomerate to a smaller company and take that real risk yeah. of one is incremental growth and 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 ease like really much more of an easy platform like i know a lot of like lawyers and accounts really if you if you make it and you're able to keep hired you're going to be more and more successful you're going to have more and more money you're going to have whatever it is but yeah. In, in what you have, you have a much higher trajectory of, of significant wealth or significant success or whatever you want to, however you perceive it. What would you, what tips would you give for people who are in the bank world or in financial services or, or in businesses that are thinking about leaving or to leave? Have a sense of what you want to do. I think there are a lot of people out there that want to leave the banks, but they don't really, they're not really putting in the work to think about like where they actually want to go or what they actually want to do. They're waiting for I don't know, like Apollo to offer them a job tomorrow and, you know, and, and be in PE and make, you know, God knows what in like five minutes. But I think, um, you know, ha have a plan of like what you want to do and try to, you know, find companies that are growing that could benefit from your expertise. If you think about doing it by yourself, you know, start building a network, think about and ask people directly, you know, if, if they would invest in you and kind of just get a sense of, you know, what you have and what you will have. And then, you know, cut it in, in half or more <laughs> and then, you know, kind of make your decisions. But I think practically speaking, you know, save your money when you're young, um, put, you know, and, and you guys are the experts in this, right? People could talk to you guys about this, but save your money, um, make sure you have a nest egg so that when you make decisions, you're, you're not kind of like worried about paying your rent or where your food, you know, next meal is going to come from. And, you know, create a moat for yourself and, and just, you know, take a risk, but do your, do your homework, like know who you're partnering with, look at the market. Like what is the, Absolutely. what are the prospects? Do your research. Yeah, it, your it, money. I mean, it's, it sounds like a theme of yours is, is you did not do anything unless you were fully calculated and fully prepared. So you did your homework yeah. pre, and then you went into something. So it's not really like a, it's not really a jump into no, like the random of this. fast. I mean, I, I certainly, yeah. grab, you know, it, it would, it would be, I would be lying if I said, I just kind of like said, you know, I was presented with the idea and the next day I said, I'm in, I, I definitely yeah, no. really thought it through. Um, well, that, that's, that's the reason. And there were some statistics on, on women in financial services is that over time, actually women have overperformed men significantly, but not in year one, not year in year two, they actually start over outperforming men year three, four, five, six, and to the, and, and much, much higher than that. So, it, so that's really how I see the trajectory of change. And and it's it's amazing kind of what you've done. You're, you're a pioneer in, in all honesty. And that's probably why everybody wants to wants to talk to you. That's probably why you, I mean, you're inspiring a, a generation of people who feel like, hey, I can do this. 
and I just need a role model or a mentor. And I'm sure you get people messaging you on LinkedIn all the time saying like, hey, what do you think about this? Or hey, like people calling you all the time, like you're a real inspiration for a lot of people because you're calculated, you take you take your time and there's something about that and you're prepared, which is which is amazing. So I think it's important what you said, like it's, you know, people have to know what they have to do. But, you know, I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, especially with younger people, they really don't know what they want to do. They don't yeah. really maybe know themselves that well. They haven't really gone through any type of, uh, you know, resilient situations to really get to know who and what they're all about, you know, and, and when they get to it, they don't really know what they want to do. Yeah. So it make you know, so you can't really put yourself together as a package when you don't when you have to go through some self discovery. I think that's a in these days that's that's what I see in the younger generation. Yeah, well. that's a great point. And so I think for like those kids that and it's true, and actually that's probably for most people. Um, and there's so many, you know, unique jobs out there too that that weren't there when I graduated college, for example, you know, like all of the social media types of stuff that people do and and you know, kind of all of that. But you know, you have to think about your goals, right? So, so if, if, if one of your goals is to be financially well off, like if you don't know exactly what you want to do, at least think of a group of areas that could lead to a lucrative career, right? You know, I mean, there are just certain jobs that are going to end up being dead end jobs. And I hate saying that because we've all done them, right? And they're important too. But, but I think like, you know, try to see the future a little bit and then take a chance and you'll find your way. I mean, yeah. um, if you're someone that has resilience, you'll make it. You're never going to make yeah, it anywhere. Right. And you'll learn a lot. I mean, I've done everything. I've done capital markets, trading, operations, sales. Like I've done every every job, I think, uh, at least at an ETF company, you know, not a bank for sure, but I've done yeah, a lot right. of stuff at banks too, like risk and trading. So through all of that, I, I like, it's really interesting because I, I think I, I had a conversation, I had lunch with my old my former, you know, boss recently. And, and, you know, he, he was like, well, what is it like? And I said, you know, this is the first time in my career ever that I actually feel like I, I can, like, I can really, you can, you can stick me in any part of anything and I'm going to figure it out now because I've yeah, learned so amazing. much now. And I have that, you know, and I think when you're young, like you, that you're always wondering, like, you know, kind of like, are you good enough? Is your boss happy with you? You want to impress people and all that stuff. And, and I think it's kind of like, let some of that go and put that energy into just like learning and, and developing yourself and making yourself the best you can be. And then like, you know, I, I read something the other day, like just actually do what you say you're going to do as a young person. And that goes a long way. <laughs> it's huge. And, and these are like, these are great pieces of advice. I mean, this is, this is real gold. Like you can, once you get into different things, you will learn it's it's like it's when you jump into something you're surrounded and you're forced to learn and you're forced if you're somebody who can, who has grit and has resilience and and is going to make it you're going to make it anywhere you're going to learn and then you're going to move to another place and you're going to keep doing that and then all of a sudden you're going to be raising one of, i mean you're probably one of the fastest etf growing etf companies in the country right now um especially in two months to raise 300 million dollars very very serious so it's it's incredible what you what you're doing. It's, it's great advice. What would be, let's say, for for people on in that are looking to get into the market for investing, things like that? What would be five tips that you would give, or, or three to five tips that you would give to people, it's purely financial, making money on your money, putting it in the market? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to steal one of your line, like you know, let your investments work for you and don't work for your investments. Sit on your hands, you know, invest in whatever it is that you believe in. You know, you, you can. It depends on kind of like what your philosophy is and and you know how you want to go to about it. You know, you can kind of like the buy low, sell high. Just have it in your mind that you know if if you're not you know a, a trader or a short term, um, you know, somebody who's kind of going to you know, beat the markets on a daily basis, which is almost all of us have longer term high, you know, time horizons and let your investments kind of pay off for you over time. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I've learned this myself too, right? Like you, you see, it, it's kind of the, the, what was it? Meme made meme stock mania that we saw a couple yeah, years absolutely. ago. Like if that wasn't a lesson and like all of the things that ended up being like bubbles and blowing up and things like that, you know, you kind of just saw people doing the same thing over and over again. Like this stock is just taking off, taking off, and then it would crash two days later and like people are getting burned. So it's, you the know, stock market, yeah, oh, it's good stock, cannabis, not a stock all these picker, places. you know, have them give their money to you, get, get, have the professionals run it. Um, if you don't want to do that, invest in a broad based index and leave it there, you know, kind of forever. I mean, I mean, 
Um, but I think it's a lot of it is just like put your money to work for you. Don't sit in cash. You know, let, again, Absolutely. let your investments work for you. Don't work for your investments and, you know, have have patience, have patience. Don't, you know, yeah, there's don't get caught up on the next fad. Yeah, every there's no there hasn't been a history a 30 year period of the S&P 500 that there has not been a positive. So if you take 30 years from, let's say, 1960 to 1990 or 1970 to 2000, it doesn't make a difference. Any 30 year period, there's never been a negative a negative return. It's only a yeah. negative if people are buying and selling and buying and selling and trying to trying to control it. Sit on your hands, focus on what you do, which is what you do best is making money. Take yeah. that money, keep parking in the places, do it till it hurts and and then and then take that pain and do more of it and keep putting just just keep pushing yourself. And that's how you set up financial autonomy, which is then you're able to then take risks and then you're able to take different jobs and things like that. So you can actually really take some say, to yeah. to really grow your career instead of living paycheck to paycheck because every time you make a raise, then you start spending more and you make a raise and you buy a house and take, make a raise and you redo the kitchen, you make a raise. So you're, you're, instead of living in that rat race, you're actually able to save, which is, I, I wouldn't say it's only an immigrant mentality, but I think immigrants are pretty damn good at it. Yeah, yeah, and it's so true. You know, we were talking about our kids and, and you know, you have the same issue that I do living in Manhattan. Every year you're like, okay, well, next year it won't be this bad because we won't need like, a nanny or something, you know, whatever it is, but like, it's, it's worse every year. <laughs> worse every year. You just got it. I just say, let's whatever just make more. Take out something say, else comes my, in. So <laughs> let me just say, from my perspective, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It just happens to be a very long, long tunnel. and dark tunnel. <laughs> I have my last child is finishing up his last year at Rutgers, and then he's going to be on. Uh, he's going to be on his own after six kids. They're all going to be off the payroll. Yeah, we find a very interesting thing that yeah. people like. Me and you, who are, thank God we're, we're earning enough, but we're paying for our kids and life is really, really expensive. Yeah. And you have to make a lot of money comparatively. Like I tell people all the time, like I'm in like the 0.001% of income earners for my age. Yeah. And, and I'm, thank God, I, I, it's great, whatever, no problem. When my kids are out, I'm not going to be making less money. I'll actually be making more because I'll have more time on my hands to actually spend more time and, and work a little bit harder if I'm, if, because I'm not a retiree either. So, yeah. All of a sudden, your expenses drop to like nothing. Your home is like paid off. Everything is done. And yeah. now you just have this huge income. And it's like, wow, like, it's amazing. So you see these people who are making five, six hundred thousand dollars And all of a sudden, they, their expenses are like, yeah, we spend like 5000 a month. And we're on Social it's Security. It's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice. Finally. Yeah, it's a finally. Um, so, so getting to know you a little bit more, um, you have some serious values, which has been really like just protruding through the screen. And we'd love to do this with you in person um, when you do have time. But if you had, if you yeah. took five values, what would they be? Um, oh gosh, it just, I think being, you know, I, I mean, I'm gonna say, I, I don't wanna sound like kind of flighty with it, but I, I think being, you know, kind of honest and, and, and moral and ethical is, is just absolutely, you know, paramount. And then, you know, loyalty and, you know, knowledge, I mean, knowledge. Education. Yeah. Education. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what would be your last one? Um, what did I say already? Um, you did, yeah. you did uh, honesty, honesty, loyalty, loyalty moral, moral, knowledge, knowledge, and, education. One more. and well, actually, I mean, the number one is like family. I, I should have put that yeah. first, you know, family. Well, you spoke about your kids. Yeah. My kids. Yeah. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, for me, that's like what all this is, what all this is for, you know, yeah, it's like you, you love, you love what you do. And you're like, I've always loved, I've always loved going to work. And I almost, I have so many friends around me that just like are hating their jobs or dreading it. And, and I think to myself, like when, when you have kids and life is so stressful and hard and like, you know, the older we get, different things happen, whether it's like parents being unwell or, you know, horrible things in the world. And um, I, I don't know, like sometimes just, having some happiness in your day-to-day -day life because of like what you do does, you know, does kind of Absolutely. create a nice bubble for, for a life. And, and yeah, I mean, I think for me, so, so I always loved working and that was really great and, and fun and energizing. And now I look at my kids and I'm like, Oh man, I want to crush this so hard now. You know, like I want to make it awesome for them. Maybe one day they'll take over the comp. Like you know, it, it's stuff like that. Like you, your whole purpose changes, and so family is yeah, obviously family and health are, are, are everything. It's not it's not obvious for a lot of people. They don't put family in their values, but that's that's yeah. really why people. I, I find when you have true core values and you have quality core values, that's when that's when success comes. 
Yeah. Um, and that's when you're able to do it. So for those people who have similar values to Sylvia, um, you're going to make it. You just need to you need to get in there. You need to get she's yourself educated. And you, no, me. the people who want to be like you, they're going to make it. You've already made it. Uh, you're, uh, no way. I'm not. I'm not even close. <laughs> I haven't done half yeah, the, of, half of what I hope to do. Right. Half half. I would probably say a quarter. But you've already I made it. Like like a quarter well, of what you want to do. Way, you know what I mean? Like I, I I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I just you know I, I and I think that's a great lesson too. Like, don't ever think you've you've like made it. Or, you know, hundred percent. Think you, that's what you Sylvia. Get, um, kids say. <laughs> how, absolutely, uh, Sylvia. How how is uh, how can people find you? Tell us a little bit about uh, where people can find you. Where can people learn a little bit more? Sure, I, you can you know find me directly through, through the Defiance website. So it's defianceetfs.com. My contact info is up there. You know you can reach out. Um, hit you know you can connect with me on LinkedIn or um, or Twitter, and I'm always happy to you know chat to anybody who's interested in, in talking and for yeah those, for before, those looking I to grow emails that come in to linkedin from like college kids that are like how do i do this i, I love that stuff and i i will always take the time i will always find well, the time well it's part of the education and and yeah. it's education for yourself and education for others and it's it's giving back and it's the morality because people have helped you and you've helped others uh sylvia thank you so much for coming on thank you guys. go this crush it fun. in the market you're doing you're, you're doing amazing um i'm just you're doing amazing. Thanks so much for coming.